The ring has been controversial ever since it was created, and Patrice Chéreau's production, again, was highly controversial. But while you will always be fascinated and entranced and enchanted, you may also be angered at some things, but I can assure you that while you are watching and listening, you will never be bored. And now a backstage look at the making of this first ring for television. Early in the summer of 1980, Richard Wagner's renowned festival house in Bayreuth, West Germany, was invaded by nearly 100 sound and video technicians. They erected metal lighting towers, installed miles of cable and wiring, and removed rows of seats from the century-old theater to provide space for television cameras. This was the beginning of one of the most ambitious and expensive undertakings in the history of music on television. During the months ahead, complete performances of Wagner's four-part operatic cycle, The Ring of the Nibelung, would be videotaped. The production was the controversial one created for Bayreuth Centennial by stage director Patrice Chéreau and conductor Pierre Boulez. During these telecasts, more people will see and hear the ring than ever before in its history. The television director for the Ring project was Brian Large, who had pioneered the filming of Wagner's operas for television. People are afraid of this piece. It's 14 hours long. It takes four nights to go to it. Yeah. But what we've tried to do is to break down the barriers, to communicate with people, to make them realize that this is a piece of human drama, a saga which they can relate to through human feelings. The freshness of Chereau's ideas and the freshness of Boulez's conducting brings the whole thing into a new perspective by treating it as music theater, television music theater, To make the ring for the first time and to do it in Bayreuth is the only place. It had to be here. The vibrations of Wagner, his house, Wagner's grandson being here, organizing everything. The omens were right. And I hope the whole thing will take on a new vista and win new converts for the ring. The first ring for television was recorded in the theater Richard Wagner designed specifically to present the cycle. Its cornerstone was laid by the composer in 1872, outside of the small town of Bayreuth. Ever since, there has always been a Wagner on this green hill to direct the festival, create productions, and guard the heritage of what has become one of the world's most important musical shrines. Wolfgang Wagner, the composer's grandson, has ruled Bayreuth single-handedly since the death of his brother Wieland in 1966. Wolfgang has produced two cycles of the ring himself, in 1960 and in 1970. 
It was he who engaged Chirot to undertake the centennial production of the ring. The essence of the work here and the special atmosphere that prevails consists first of all in being able to measure one's ability against music of outstanding value and significance. We are not concerned at Bayreuth with creating just any performance of anyone's work. Rather, it is a question of bringing the work of Richard Wagner to the stage in ways which are new and which constantly open up new aspects within its meaning. The intense commitment here is possible only because each person comes to Bayreuth exclusively for the purpose of understanding better Wagner's dramas and music. Patrice Chirot was only 31 when Wolfgang Wagner invited him to Bayreuth. He had staged only two operas previously, one by Offenbach and one by Rossini. Engaging him for so important a project as the Centennial Ring was an enormous gamble. Chirot had less than four months to produce the four operas which make up the ring. At first, he doubted it could be done. Before I refused one time, I almost refused to do, because the, 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 the time was too, too short, I, I thought, and I, was, I thought it was uh, impossible for me to do. I have not the force, uh, the craft, the uh, energy to, to do that. And then I, I, I tried to, to accept, to, 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 don't, to forget the, the, the short time, and I accept. And uh, my first, uh, I discover first when, by, when I saw the ring here, for example, in '75, that Wagner was always theater. It was not only opera, but always theater, always mat uh, theatrical mat material, theatrical dramaturgy, and that was important because. And, for example, during the, the rehearsals, the first rehearsals of uh, 76, I had the impression that Wagner pushed me to do, to do already, always uh, theater and not opera. A man of the theater, Chirot began with the text. He did not know the music, having never seen the cycle until the summer of 1975, when he heard it in Bayreuth at the invitation of Wolfgang Wagner. I try first to read the story of the ring and to have a very simple approach in the way to tell the story, this story, so simple as possible for people. I think uh, Wagner used, for example, the myth mythology for, uh, to tell story and to, or to, to give a point of view on his time, of the story of his time, of the politics of his time. It was conductor and champion of the avant-garde, Pierre Boulez, who brought Chirot, the enfant terrible of the French theater, to the attention of Wolfgang Wagner. Well, you know, I am always very interested uh, with theater and with the uh, producers. And uh, I have heard about him uh, in France quite a lot. And then I saw productions by him. And I was totally convinced that uh, if uh, somebody has to do uh, a production, it has to be somebody like that. You never know, you take a bet. I mean, you never know if uh, things will be successful or not. I mean successful from an achievement point of view. I don't uh, think first of the audience. But I mean, uh, uh, I was sure that's the kind of uh, fresh blood that a uh, theater producer will bring into the opera will be a very good. Like Chirot, Boulez became the center of an enormous controversy. In his quest for detail and transparency in the music, he refined the sound of the orchestra, at times almost to chamber dimensions. The musicians, accustomed to making richer, thicker sounds, threatened a strike and formed a committee to ask Wolfgang Wagner to allow them to play out louder. Well, my main goal was to get rid of, of uh, uh, what this, the so-called tradition, you know, which, which for me also is unbearable. So, I mean, uh, what is tradition? So if you, if you get to this point, so tradition is really mannerisms of somebody which are transmitted and transformed in worst mannerism because they have no um, raison d'être at, at this point. You know, everybody has his mannerism. I'm sure that I have my own mannerisms. But uh, I don't ask uh, anybody to imitate me. 
And therefore, if you are asking as to what Ford Wengler was doing also in the 30s, well, certainly it was. was because it was him and it was this time and now you can not have at all the same approach who seen Brunhilde in the telecast of the ring, came to Bayreuth in 1966. She first sang Brunhilde in Wolfgang Wagner's 1970 production in the abstract style a style which has become known as Neo-Bayreuth. From the beginning of the centennial ring, Gwyneth Jones was one of Chirot's strongest supporters. Chirot, for my first entrance as Brunhilde, he wanted me to be a young, joyous teenager, full of fun, and playing games with, with Wotan. So I come running in, and, and the hoya to hose we are, and throwing him off with a spear, and, and really, it's, it's, it's so wonderful, and it, it helps one in a way to sing the hoya to hose with such zest and zip. came to it completely open. He'd never done the ring before. He'd only seen the ring uh, here in Bayreuth, one performance. And so he was completely fresh and, 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 and open for new ideas. And he looked into the text and he saw what was there. And he asked us to do everything that is in the text, uh, which is, in my case, uh, this wonderful warmth and love and joy and uh, childish uh, uh, action in, in Siegfried, this, this wonderful uh, excitement that we have, the lovers. <laughs> The final performance of the Chirot Ring in 1980 received 85 minutes of ovation and over 100 curtain calls, a record for Bayreuth. But at its premiere, the production had caused a scandal unique in the history of the theatre. William Mann, music critic of the London Times, was a member of the audience that first stormy summer of the Chirot Ring. Chirot chose to set the ring basically in the middle of the 19th century, the height of the Industrial Revolution, which was the period that Wagner was writing the work himself, and which Bernard Shaw, almost 100 years ago, in his book, The Perfect Wagnerite, recognized as being the meaning of the ring. 
It was a myth about the evils of power and the lust for money. Chiro and designer Richard Peduzzi used the festival stage to remind audiences of the political and social history which has taken place since the writing and first performances of The Ring. They set the four operas in a shifting time period, beginning in the 1840s when Wagner began work on the cycle and ending in the 1920s when the festival was in the hands of his son Siegfried. In Chiro's retelling of this story, Wotan's castle is a pastiche of architectural styles. The Rhine maidens are prostitutes frolicking on a hydroelectric dam. Wotan and the other gods, dressed in brocades and laces, are bewigged, vain and lazy. Hunding, dressed in the period of the ring's premiere, looks like a wealthy mine owner. Gunther wears formal dinner clothes and his half-brother Hagen a wrinkled business suit. Alberich and the Nibelungen live and work in a coal mine that looks like the basement of a big city tenement. And Siegfried forges his sword with a huge steam-driven drop in. Those who objected to this staging did not accept the premise of Chirot's production, the industrial revolution's corruption of mankind. Nor did they understand the displacement of time he used as the framework for his approach. Yet the music and even the theater itself had caused hardly less of a stir a century earlier. Since Richard Wagner moved himself and his family to Bayreuth in the last century, artistic revolution and innovation have become part of the city's heritage. The first revolution was the building of this unique theater and the premiere here of the completed ring cycle in 1876. The second came in 1951, when Wagner's grandsons, Wieland and Wolfgang, emptied the Bayreuth stage of its literal trappings and replaced them with abstract sets, subtle lighting, and stark movement. The third came in 1976, when Wolfgang turned to the team of Chirot and Boulez in order to reset the theater's course. When I first saw Chirot's ring, I was bowled over by a lot of things, but for me it was perhaps the most human ring I'd ever seen. It was certainly the funniest ring I've ever seen, certainly the wittiest ring, and also the cruelest ring I'd ever seen. And it, although it may have developed and certainly has changed over the last five years, working now on it and getting to know it even closer than then, I do realize that these qualities remain. The operas of Richard Wagner were described in his day as the music of the future. This had to do as much with his original use of harmony and orchestration as it did with his individual writing for the voice and the extraordinary theories which form the basis of his opera. To Wagner, opera was more than a matter of music plus drama. It was a grand 
synthesis in which every aspect of a work and its production were welded into a single expressive unit. He was his own libretist. He was also a major conductor and later became a stage director and lighting designer as well. Still, he wanted more control. He wanted the theater of his own. to his own specification. This dream became a pressing need with the creation of the ring. Wagner based the cycle on ancient folk sagas, dealing with a massive power struggle between a race of subhumans called the Nibelungen and the gods high above them in Valhalla. The stakes were the universe itself. It was a struggle which ended in the destruction of both races. Wagner's unprecedented drama of gods and dragons, incest, greed, hate, and redeeming love came to life on a summer's evening in 1876. Wagner's disappointment with the productions was keen when he saw his god strutting on stage before the first night audience as though at a costume party, and a trio of Rhine maidens so ornately gowned that any illusion of swimming was lost. The composer died in 1883. Only one ring was produced at Bayreuth during his lifetime. Despite its shortcomings, the production demonstrated the power and originality of the cycle and its music. It's the greatest epic that any musician has put down on paper. And I think you could probably say that it's the greatest epic that any dramatist has ever got onto the stage. And as such, it's so big that it's susceptible to an endless number of interpretations. And all that any producer can hope to do is to highlight one particular relevant aspect of its universality. Patrice Chero has done that, I think, in this Bayreuth production. In the 
the summers following the production's premiere in 1976, Chéreau and Boulez gradually reworked and rethought aspects of their approach. The fourth act in three fourths in the second scene, at the beginning of the second scene. Because these articulations are not together at the same time. One, two, three. Ja, Papa, Papa. Ja, da, 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 da. Nein, nicht zu früh. Sie haben eine. Eins, zwei, drei. Da, 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 da. Ja. Ganz am letzten Sechzehntel, ja. Können wir nochmal dasselbe? Eins, zwei. Ja, The orchestra began to understand Boulez's search for transparency and detail. Tom. The singers and the audience began to sense the human and allegorical planes on which Chirot was working. Okay, good. In the summer of 1980, when their production was given for the final time, it was recorded for television. The director was Brian Large. No matter how many times you've seen the scores, no matter how many times you've taken them apart, you've still got to go back and look for fundamentals. It wasn't necessary for Fro to trust me and for me to trust him. And it's also hard for him also to know what I'm seeing of his and to know from his point of view what I'm going to translate that into. You've got to be able to be on the floor to see what it is that Shiro is doing. in a sense, from behind his head, through his eyes, what he is trying to get from the artist. So what I'm trying to do is to, to find out if I can build a series of pictures which will grow dramatically. After we've done rehearsal stages, I mean, a great deal of bookwork has to be done first. Everything that has been shouted at or thought about or discussed in rehearsal uh, has to be put on paper. And when that's done, we will have a, a series of meetings with the cameramen so that they know what it is they're looking for and how best to achieve it. Done by me six and Sipsik is back. What I'm trying to do there is to get the best angle. I'm trying to get the best place to position a camera. I've got to find out whether I can actually get the most dramatic effect on a certain lens or angle. The first camera rehearsal is always with piano. 
Well, hopefully we will have got something sensible out of it and after a lot of consultation and discussion. next camera rehearsal will be with orchestra and we go into our control room. That is our dress rehearsal on camera. So, 55 is the one. So, no. And afterwards, we review that, make corrections, we try to polish what we can and prepare ourselves for the next day when we have two recording sessions. When we record here, we record everything in acts. That means that the whole of Valkyrie 1 is a non-stop 61-minute take. There are no stops and starts. It is a performance. And hopefully, the public, when they see this, will recognize it as a performance, as a live performance. OK, let's do it. We've actually come out with a single product, which I think we have. It's been achieved simply because we've had a partnership. There's been a sort of three-way partnership, which has been headed by Boulez. His musical tempi, his whole, whole idea of the ring, have dictated the style in many ways and the pacing of Chirot's ring. And consequently, my own attitude to the way that I've wanted to shoot it and treat it has been dictated by what Chirot is doing, by what Boulez is doing. And the fact that we have had this marvellous three-part um, confrontation sometimes, but marvellous communication has actually helped to bring the whole thing to a good head. The Chiro production was a far cry from what the ring had come to mean early in Bayreuth's history. It was during the reign of Wagner's widow, Cosima, the daughter of Franz Liszt, that the first Bayreuth style was established. You have only to look at this famous photograph of Richard Wagner and his wife, she gazing with devotion at her lover and master, to realize that for Cosima, Bayreuth was a sacred trust, a heritage given into her keeping. For two years after Wagner's death, she could not find the strength to take up the festival's directorship, and only Wagner's production of Parsifal, his last opera, was given at Bayreuth. Gradually, Cosima emerged from her mourning and achieved Wagner's dream, presenting all of his operas at Bayreuth. She began in 1886 with Tristan and Isolde, then Meistersinger, Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, and The Flying Dutchman. In 1896, she also undertook a new mounting of the ring. Looking at the set and costume designs for this ring, it is obvious Cosima was attempting to preserve her husband's wishes and ideas while trying to improve upon the inadequacies of the first Bayreuth ring. The costumes, for example, were simplified and the use of color was more unified. The Rhine maidens were hung in harnesses to simulate swimming, and schoolboys on wooden horses represented the Valkyries riding through the air. In her zeal to reproduce her husband's wishes, Cosima imposed a rigid system of attitudes, actions, and reactions which were synchronized with the music. Soprano Lily Lehman, who had been a Rhine maiden in the 1876 ring, 
writes in her biography that Cosima carried the everlasting standing in profile to the point of madness. When challenged on any of her changes, she would turn to her son Siegfried, who had only been six at the first Bayreuth ring. You remember, do you not, that it was done this way in 1876? I believe you are right, Mama, Siegfried would reply. In 1907, at the age of 70, Cosima turned the directorship of the festival over to Siegfried. Some see him as a man who lived in the shadow of his father, between a domineering mother and a strong-willed wife, who took over the festival after his death. But Siegfried's achievements were significant, as his daughter Friedeland recalls. So when my father burst upon the scene, first in 92, as an assistant to all the other assistants, in very minor functions, uh, he first uh, st he started on the lighting tower. And lighting was his great passion, as it, of course, was also Wieland's, uh, the passion of his life. The evolution of the stage set, of course, is due, I think, to the constant improvement of the lighting equipment. In the old days, in, in the gaslight, and of course, even more so in the, in the candlelight eras, uh, you had to use hangers, I mean canvas which was painted, because the light source was so limited. So every few feet you had another hanger. Then as lights improved, the three-dimensional set came in. You built really things that you could stand upon. Well, the 1924 ring had a lot of hangovers from the pre-war ring. And it was only in 25 that my father started to build new sets. So this is naturally part of my father's contribution because simply as the lighting and the technical equipment got more efficient, you were able to modernize everything and to do away with many of the old things. In 1914, when Siegfried was 45, he met a young English girl of 17 named Winifred Williams. She was the adopted daughter of one of Richard Wagner's most ardent disciples. It almost seemed predestined that one day she would become Siegfried's bride. And indeed, they were married a year after their first meeting, just as World War I was beginning. As the conflict escalated, the Bayreuth Festival was shut down for a decade. Siegfried and Winifred started a family destined to become the next Bayreuth dynasty. Friedeland, born in 1918, Wieland in 1917, Wolfgang in 1919, and Verena in 1920. With the death of Siegfried, Winifred Wagner began what was to become one of the most controversial periods in the life of Bayreuth. That when there is a cesura, like the death of one head of the festival, and in his place, some 33-year-old beautiful young widow, that the old generation, of course, immediately predicts doom. Mother, of course, brought in Heinz Tietjen, the director of all the Prussian state theaters. He brought his team from Berlin, which was very convenient and very sensible. Heinz teaching brought Emil Pretorius, and they renewed the ring in 33. With them, they also brought an absolute genius of a technical director. It was a young team, and Paul Eberhardt, he really completely renewed everything backstage at the Feschbühl House. This was a period of naturalism. Even with the technical improvements made by Winifred Wagner, 
Bayreuth became a theater without a profile, more the summer home of the Berlin Opera. Wieland and Wolfgang took over the festival after the war, and the first season was in 1951. Wieland, uh, in the beginning, was in charge of all the artistic matters, and Wolf of the, Wolfgang of the administration. Uh, from 54 four on, Wolfgang also, on occasion, uh, uh, alternated with Wieland in uh, directing an opera. And, uh, but I mean, the real sort of uh, revolution of the new Bayreuth came about at that time. Wieland swept everything off stage, and then, of course, he really started life as a painter. And so he really, instead of using sets and things, he used uh, lighting to tremendous effect. And uh, I think he was an unparalleled artist in that. I don't think there's anyone who ever quite matched his art. In 1966, with the death of Wieland Wagner, his brother Wolfgang assumed the direction of the festival alone. A few years later, Wolfgang created a new ring cycle, which was an outgrowth and a refinement of his previous staging a decade earlier. As the centennial year of the festival approached, Wolfgang made the courageous decision to create a new and different sort of ring with Boulez and Chero. When I was faced with the question of producing a new staging of the ring for the 100th anniversary, naturally the question arose as to the stylistic direction it should go, for there is always something to be thought out in a new way. In the first year of his production, he was certainly misunderstood. In fact, there was little he wasn't accused of, from a lack of seriousness to ignorance. But after five years of this production, I would say all the misunderstandings have been cleared up and it will assume a substantial place within Bayreuth history. And of course, one must never forget that Wagner said, Kinder schafft Neues. Children create new, new theater. And Patrice has certainly done this. And the most exciting thing that I think about this ring is that after the premiere, and in fact, e even now, uh, people are reading the text. They're having tremendous arguments about what is in the text and what is not in the text, and this is right. You see, he's, he's done it right because it's, it's all here in the text, and, and they have the most violent arguments. And I think it's wonderful because it, 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 it really makes people think and creates a tremendous enthusiasm and, and make people go back to the text and, and study it, because of course that, that's what we're here for in Bayreuth, is to make the pieces live and make them actually, make them fit into our time. And this ring is a ring of our time. Like Gwyneth Jones, Donald McIntyre, who sings Wotan, has been a part of the Chiro production from its inception. I had a marvelous experience uh, with the ring here in Bayreuth because I came in uh, the Wolfgang production. Now, the, these two brothers, Wieland and Wolfgang, the grandsons of Richard Wagner, 
after the war, they decided that the tradition had become so overlaid from years and years of performing that people had forgotten the real reasons. So they decided to take everything out of the ring to allow people to just really make up their own minds what this is about. And now Chirot's come along and put it all back again, but not in the way that it was previously. It has been made possible because all this uh, tradition that people don't understand the reason for any longer has been dealt a fatal blow. And we can, or Chirot was able to start afresh and to see what this ring, this great work of Wagner is all about. The youngest member of the Chirot ring cast was American soprano Janine Altmaier, who sang the roles of Siglenda and Gutruna, seen here in a coaching session with Boulez's assistant, conductor Jeffrey Tate. Yeah. I think I have something funny to do on the stage there. You rush, actually, you, you have a move from you. 